Hi, welcome to week five of the accounting course, Sunshine Accounting course. Um, we're going to cover this week um, uh, illustrations. We've had feedback from quite a number of people that they've had quite a lot of information to take on board and they're a bit anxious about it. So I thought this week might be nice if we have a bit more of a relaxed session where I just go through and explain and illustrate some of the accounting stuff we've talked about to summarize it really and to run through a few examples. So that instead of it being a bit dry and not really uh, a bit conceptual, it's gonna start becoming much more practical. So just to summarize uh, uh, last week's course, we talked about uh, double entry, um, how to create a trial balance, uh, journals, how you make corrections to the trial balance, and we touched on debits and credits. That's a very ugly, but very necessary accounting language. And this week, uh, we're going to review all the points that we've covered so far in a summary format. And in particular, we're going to review the accounting process. We're going, and the accounting process will bring together everything we've done in a practical way. It's almost a template of how you prepare accounts from scratch. And then we'll go through a few practical examples. And the practical examples will take most of, of what we're talking about today. So just reviewing the key points of what accounting is all about. Accounting is about making sense of transactions. We have these sort of chaotic transactions that are just all over the place. And we really need to make some sort of meaningful, meaningful assessment of what's happening. And that's what accounting is all about. So everything we're talking about is how do we make sense of these uh, uh, sporadic transactions to make something that's actually meaningful or useful. We talked very briefly about the different types of accounting statements, the income and expenditure account, the accounting over a period, and also the balance sheet, the asset statements, both at the beginning and the end of a period. And we've talked quite a bit about the uh, income and expenditure, the movements. We haven't yet started talking about the balance sheet or the assets and liabilities, those we're going to cover in future courses. But we then talked a bit about how you classify uh, accounting transactions in a meaningful way to the business. And of course, it might be uh, that you're doing management accounts, which are accounts for management, where they have a particular perspective, or you might be doing statutory accounts, which have to follow specific formats that can be compared uh, from one company to another. So depending on the type of accounts you're preparing, the accounts classifications need to fall into line. Then we talk briefly about uh, how you prevent accounting errors. Accounting errors are the bane of accounting. And if you make errors, all of the meaning you get from accounts will be wrong. You'll make wrong decisions. And so quite a lot of effort is spent in accounting to preventing errors in the first place. And we talk, for example, about the bank reconciliation, about a number of accounting controls. Then we talked about the trial balance, the sort of the engine of the accounting process, where the uh, basic transactions are summarized and classified and flows through to the trial balance. And then where it goes from the trial balance to the accounting process, uh, to the accounts themselves. And we talked a little bit about the journals and the debits and credits are part of that process of the trial balance accounting. So I'm now briefly going to talk about the accounting process, and I've been very keen that you don't need to write anything down when you're doing the accounting uh, course. But if you did want to write anything down, particularly if you're new to accounting, this might be something to write down. Although do be aware you can download the presentation uh, from our website, uh, from the sunshinecourt.courses website, the accounting course, uh, where you can, of course, just uh, print it out if you want to. But for people that are new to accounting, or even for people that are well experienced with accounting, this process is really the, the heart of what we do with accounting. And this is what we're going to be illustrating for the rest of the conference, uh, the course today. Uh, and we start off by choosing the right categories for the business. So in order to do that, you have to know what the business is, so you can understand what the business needs, and that's how you decide what the categories are. We then list the transactions that were spent during the month or the year or whatever period we're doing, dealing with. Um, and we call them, uh, put them into a book called the cash book, even though it's no longer cash 
that's the majority of things uh, of transactions. We still call it the cash book. Um, then we perform bank reconciliation. This is part of the that probably the most significant of all accounting controls to identify or pick up errors. Then we actually go ahead and categorize the transactions. Once we know that we've got the right numbers uh, to categorize, we then summarize them. Those flow through to the trial balance. We look at the trial balance to see if there's anything clearly obviously wrong with the accounts. We examine things that look wrong or feel wrong. If there are any changes to be put through, we journalize them. We create journals using these debits or credits. And then finally, we transfer the category totals to the accounts. And that's how you start from the individual transactions and go right the way through to preparing meaningful accounts. So we're going to look at three separate sets of accounts. One is a restaurant. And a restaurant, uh, we, I picked a restaurant because it's quite easy to, to relate to what a restaurant does and what a restaurant is. But I just wanted to highlight that the restaurant um, serves goods. It serves food. And so although we're doing a restaurant, it could be any organization that sells goods. It might be a craft fair. It might be a, um, you might do personal stuff that you make at home and sell on the internet right the way through to retailing who sell um, goods, you might sell clothes, you might sell gifts um, to any type of goods. You could, could be a manufacturer of, uh, of metal works. So any, so the, the restaurant illustration will apply to any organization that sells goods. And I chose a musician to illustrate services. So this is a musician who sell their time and you pay for their time and selling time is we, we refer to it as services. And there's a different type of transactions uh, and accounting that goes on for services. They have a lot in common, but they do vary in different ways. But just as with the restaurant, the idea is that that's representative of goods. The idea of this musician is as representative of services. So anybody that carries out any services will be able to follow what's going on in the musician's accounting. And that might be, for example, someone who cleans, does cleaning or cleaning services for other people, or it might be accountants who sell their time. That's what I used to do when I was younger. Um, or it might be uh, anybody that's, that's um, caring for other people, anybody that's, that's selling their time, um, us providing services. And then the final category we're going to look at very briefly is a charitable sector, um, and it's a food bank. It happens to be goods, but as it happens, the food bank also provides some services as well. We'll focus just on the good side of it. And what I just wanted to highlight is that you can have an organization that both sells goods and also services. As far as a charity is concerned, it doesn't so much sell them as provide them. And what you're looking for is not to find out what your profits are. You're looking just to make sure that you have enough income to cover your activities. So each of the goods, the restaurant, services, the musicians, and the charity, the food bank, um, each of those entities has their own um, special, uh, special requirements. So I'm now going to uh, load up the first um, uh, um, accounts that we're going to look at, and that's uh, the restaurant. Uh, and frustratingly, I can't find the restaurant. Oh, there we go. Good. So um, in Burnham, we have a restaurant, Italian restaurant, Artigiano del Cibo. Um, and this is really just to, uh, although this um, illustration doesn't relate to them at all, it was just to sort of to whet the appetite to try and make it meaningful. But the question that we're going to start with, if you remember the process starts with a categorization, what is it that's key to a restaurant that we want to keep track of? And remember, this could be any goods that we're selling. So in terms of a restaurant, I start off by looking at the revenue streams. What are the key revenue streams that we need to identify for a restaurant? Well, the first thing is a restaurant creates an ambience so that people will pay money to visit the restaurant. Um, the restaurant prepares meals for people. And of course, it's the preparing of the meals. That are the goods that we're talking about within a restaurant. Um, of course, you can... Uh, buy goods in the restaurant and then these days in COVID times 
um, almost all of the restaurant activities are, are takeaway. So um, the ambiance, of course, is less important for the takeaway business. Although interestingly, it's not irrelevant because when people come to pick up the food, they're still getting a sense of what the restaurant is all about, the excitement, the, the feel of it. Um, and a restaurant can prepare meal for events. So um, although with that retail restaurant, most restaurants make most of their money from people coming to visit the restaurant, most successful restaurants also provide meals for businesses or other events because it supplements their income without increasing their overheads greatly. And so from an accounting point of view, we want to highlight the potential benefits of these events so that the restaurants can identify quite how profitable it is once they've covered their base costs. And then I'm going to touch a little bit on preparing meals, not necessarily for events, but in a charitable sense, these days, a number of restaurants, and I know Artigiano Del Cibo do this as well, um, have started preparing meals for um, children who are not at school, therefore not getting the school meals, who are hungry, uh, the children in poverty. So they need to make sure that their costs are covered, either by donations uh, or by the schools paying them or, or the charities paying them, um, or just if they're paying it for themselves, they need to know how much it's going to co it's cost. So we'll distinguish those costs and revenues. Those are the revenue streams. And the main costs of a restaurant, the key cost is food and drinks. So if a restaurant gets the food and drinks wrong, that's the end of the restaurant. So we really need to identify that separately. But in addition to that, there's the cost of running the restaurant. And the main difference between the food and drinks and the running costs are that the food and drinks vary. If you sell more from the menu, you spend more food costs. And if you uh, sell less restaurant meals, you don't use so much food. But a lot of the running costs of the restaurant are fixed. Whether you sell food or not, you've still got to pay rent. You've still got to pay your staff. And there's a number of administrative costs. So those are the key things that if we're doing restaurant accounts, we want to identify. So when we do our categories, those are the key aspects we want to distinguish and to highlight and to summarize. And things to watch out for, how much markup do you make on your food or drinks? A markup is say, if you buy food for 10 pounds, how much do you sell it for in your, uh, in your menu? Uh, and typically you should be selling it for 15, 20 or 25 pounds. If you pay 10 pounds for food and you sell it for five pounds, you don't have much of a business. So how much you mark up on the food is really important. And that will help you decide what type of food to get where to buy your food and what price to put in the menu. Although, of course, if you overprice food, people won't come and then you've got a problem all in itself. But remember that the purpose of accounts is to help you distinguish all these key, key critical factors. Then a couple of other key points for restaurants, how much the cost of a chef is, because a chef is really critical to the restaurant, how much food wastage there is. You buy a bunch of food, food is perishable. If you don't use it within two or three days, you may well have to sell it. If you're not able to reuse it safely and tastily in your menu, you've uh, got to throw it away. And food wastage is a huge impact, has a huge impact on restaurants. And of course, the amount of your administrative cost, your fixed costs are really key. So let's look at the transactions. The transactions start off with the cash book. And I've just given you an extract of a few transactions because we've already covered this quite a lot in, in a lot of detail. But this is where we're listing each of the individual transactions. And so the first point of accounting, once we decided on the categories, is let's write the entries down in a cash book because that's the basis from which we're going to categorize them. Before I do anything else, I'm going to do a bank rec. So although I put this all on the one sheet, I've got the cash book and separately the bank statement, I'm going to go through and I can see, for example, that Anderson School have paid £156 in the cash book, and I can see it's in my bank statement of £156. So do you remember we put a little X to um, show that we've reconciled it? Well, I'm actually going to do something, um, I, I've pre-done this because I didn't want to waste time um, with stuff that we've already done. So I've already done a reconciliation, and if I can remember how to do so, I'm going to um, uh, just show what I've done. 
Okay, so I've already done this reconciliation. Um, I just want to highlight something though. Can you see instead of putting an X, I put the letter B here. The reason I did this is I'm doing a slightly slight variant on my reconciliation, which is I'm not only going to tick off one item against another, I'm also going to, be, I want to be able to distinguish later which item I ticked off against which. So this is just a little bit of a technique which is a refinement for reconciliations. And the time you're going to want to do this is if you have lots of transactions that are, that are all of the same amount. And typically, if, for example, you've got a subscription, um, um, so sort of membership fee, people are paying the same amount each time, um, then what's very easy for you to do is to tick one item from the receipt, uh, from the cash book, and tick it twice in the bank statement. So by having this system of using letters or numbers or more sophisticated ABC that you can really do whatever you want to do, um, it, it allows you to be able to distinguish if you've misallocated or misticked at a later date. So in this particular case, you can see all the items that I have reconciled. Remember that this, just, this is just an extract for the whole month, so you're not gonna see everything that's here. And there are a few items that have not been ticked off. So I'm going to create my bank reconciliation where I'm going to list them down because what I want to do is to make sure that if the accounts are incorrect, I correct them before I do the accounts. So in this particular example, you may look, we started off the bank balance and the bank statement showed 3,000 pounds and it ended up with an overdraft of 8,000 pounds. So just if you look at the bank rec, um, uh, we end up with 8,000 pounds. Similarly, in the bank statement, in our cash book, we're showing 11,000 pounds. And in the bank statement, it shows 11,000 pounds. So straight away, there's a difference. And we want to know what the difference is. And if I go through, I can see the first item is Bucks Council, 1,400 pounds. I need to record that. And sure enough, we sent a check to the Bucks Council of 1,400 pounds. It hadn't yet cleared the bank statement. So it's a valid payment. As it turns out, it went through on the 2nd of March, but during the, as at the 28th of February, it was shown as an item that had been recorded as being paid in the cash book, not yet in the bank statement. And by putting it in this item under the bank statement showing unpresented payment, when this finally does get presented, it will reduce the bank balance. So it's a minus. What that's telling us is there's no errors in the accounting. It's just a timing difference. And similarly, there was another check to Royal Brewers. Again, that went through on the 2nd of March. However, on the 28th of March, you can't see it in this list because it doesn't go to the 28th of March. But on the 28th of March, we had banked some money, which had cleared the bank, but we'd forgotten to record it in the bank statements. So we've actually got an error in the bank statements. And similarly, if you look at the cash book, um, there is various bankings that are unrecorded. Sorry, I want to say wrong, I got this wrong. The bankings on the 28th of February, which we banked, reached the bank on the 1st of March. So it's an adjustment to the bank statement as at the 28th of February. There's no accounting error. But on the 24th of February, we forgot to record 3,912 pounds of bankings. So that's an error in the accounts. We need to correct the cash book in order for the accounts to be correct. And finally, there were some bank charges. The bank had made some charges. We didn't realize they had done so until we came to do the bank reconciliation. So again, we need to put that through the cash book. And this reconciliation shows that with the cash book, if we were to correct the cash book by putting through the unrecorded bankings and bank charges, we'd arrive at 7,000 pounds. But with the bank statements, if we wait for these unpresented items to come through, that will also bring us back down to 7,000 pounds. These tally with each other, We've now got the correct figures. Very happy with that. I'll go through and correct the bank statement, uh, correct the cash book. And this next item is the corrected cash book. So I've now put through the transactions that have been missed out. Again, you can only see an extract here, but these are corrected. And look at the categories that I've used. I distinguish food that we eat in, take away, or school. Um, I've then put the categories for costs of food, drinks, kitchen staff, waiting staff, rent and rates and others. And others would actually be quite a lot of different categories. I just put them all together. But these categories are all the categories 
that we picked out when we were deciding what are the key attributes of a restaurant. So I've got my audit trail, so I can go back to find the individual transactions if I want to. Notice here on the payroll, I haven't got an audit trail. That's because I've got a whole file for payroll. I don't need to have a separate audit trail. It's very obvious where I keep it. That may or may not be true. I haven't got one here on bankings. That's actually more serious because how do I know why I chose eat-in and takeaway? They're different figures that might be wrong. Without an audit trail, it could be that I'm making a mistake, but happily, I've also got a separate bankings file, so I know that I don't need to, to write this audit trail down here. But I list all of my movements, and my movements tally with what came uh, with the bank reconciliation. And I'm going to put all of these transactions through to my child balance. So, slightly make this a little bit bigger. So the um, cash book transactions, there was not net payments of £9,000, going back to the cash book, net outgoings of £9,000. And then because this is an accounting entry, my debits and credits flow based on which it is. I'm using the simplified format because it's easier for me to understand and therefore irritating or frustratingly sales are a negative figure, even though they're good because they're the opposite of money going into the bank. They're the other side, the money going into a bank will be a debit. So the sale must be a credit. And I'm gonna list all of my transactions. My transactions have to equal zero, so I've got a sum. So the total here is a check sum and the figures all equal zero. This is my movements in the month. Notice that my opening balance, my balance at the beginning of the 31st of January doesn't tally. This is because I made a mistake. When I go back and look at it, that should have said 12,400 pounds. The only way you would know that is by going back to look at the balance sheet as at the previous accounting period, pick up my error, that's now corrected. My checksum was very valuable because it highlight, drew, drew attention to the problem. And I've now correctly put through my transactions. Um, if any of these transactions were incorrect, I'd need to correct them. So for example, when I look at the kitchen staff, I might know that I've made a mistake. And actually my kitchen staff um, should be lower and my waiting staff should be higher. And the only way I would know this is if I knew what the figures should be. But for example, I might reduce my kitchen staff by 700 pounds. So this brings a set 3,700 pounds back to 3,000. But conversely, my waiting staff should be 700 pounds. Notice I've typed the wrong amount in here, but I've got a check sum. So with a simple entry would pick up quite easily, but let me fix that to make it 700 pounds. I've now put my journal through and corrected it. I would create a formal journal of 20, uh, which is referenced by this and create a separate journal figure. And I would reference back to the documentation that showed why I've made this journal so that I could at a later date validate that that was correct. And now wonderfully, I've got all of my transactions. I've got my balances at the start of the period, all of my transactions during the period, they've summarized through to the balance at the end of the period, I'm very happy because my debits and credits equal each other, which means one possible type of error is eliminated. And all I now need to do is to transfer these figures through to my formal accounts, my, my formatted accounts. And I'm very happy because I've now got my complete set of accounts. My complete set of accounts show sales of 27,000 pounds. You'll notice I've compared these with the same period, the same month the previous year. And the reason for that is it's often easier to pick out errors by comparing one set of figures against another. So that's another accounting control. But I've got sales of 27,000 down from 44,000 last year. Of course, anyone who's been involved in the restaurant trade during COVID, this will come as no surprise. Um, my cost of sales of 26,000 pounds. Um, you may remember I distinguished my cost of sales, which are food, kitchen staff, equi equipment and maintenance, the cost that directly rates relate to creating this food. I've just got a gross profit of 600 pounds, 900 pounds. And look, last year it was 15,000 pounds. So my fixed overheads are 10,000 pounds this year compared with 12,000 last year. We've actually saved a bit of money. But look, we've hemorrhaged money this month we, were, we did make a profit last year of just 3,600 pounds. This year we made a huge loss. The value of these accounts is it helps us identify what's going wrong. 
where have we made the loss? And the answer is, we have too many fixed costs. We need to do something about it. We have to do something about it if we want to stay in business because we're just gonna run out of money. And our markup on the, sale, on the, the sales is nowhere near enough. So again, we have to do something about it. And it could be we have to revise our sales prices or it could be we have to look for new food suppliers. Or we have to be more creative about our menu so that it costs less to create the food. So just to summarize what we've done as accountants, we've decided what our key attributes are. You generally just do that at the start of a, of a, of a year or period. Um, we've then listed out the transactions, done the bank reconciliation. We recorded the bank reconciliation to, to distinguish which of the difference of differences were just timing differences where there's no error compared with the ones where there were accounting errors. And then we've corrected the accounting errors, either by journals or by correcting the cash book. In this case, I corrected the cash book before I did my analysis. I then went to bring those figures through to the trial balance. I still had a journal to put through. There might have been two or three journals. And I then created my accounts. I'm really happy. I started off this course not knowing how to do anything with accounting at all, or maybe I did know about accounting, but I was a bit rusty. And here I've got this very simple process from beginning to end of how I do accounts. So I'm very happy. I'm now gonna go very quickly through the other two um, uh, accounts. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the musician. And I'm primarily going to show, um, uh, I'm primarily going to show, talk about the attributes. Um, so this is a, a Phoebe Catis. She's a friend of the family, um, incredibly talented musician. She writes music and plays it. So as it happens, most of her work is done um, uh, selling albums. Um, but I want to pretend that she's got a band and she rents out the primary, her primary business is renting, her, renting out her time um, at events. So she goes to music events, um, businesses. I ran a training course once and we um, asked if she could come along and sing um, uh, after the, the course so that we had a networking meeting afterwards. Um, and so she's selling her time. She's coming along and she's selling, she sings and, and what we're buying from her is her skill at selling and it's the time she's selling. She's providing music, music service. She also does concerts. I said, and this is not this, these figures don't relate to Phoebe, it's just a, a, a conceptual musician. Um, she um, creates songs for people to play on streaming services. So she's now starting to sell products as well as services. Once she's created the, the music on Spotify, for example, it doesn't matter how many people listen to it, she doesn't spend, spend any additional time writing that music. So if you want to go along and listen to Phoebe Catis on Spotify, you'll be buying some goods for her, even though primarily this is about selling services. She's doing both, but primarily about services. She creates songs for people to download. She creates DVDs. And she creates videos which are on, on YouTube. And again, she's got some fabulous videos on, on YouTube. Her costs, um, she buys music, musical equipment. As a musician, you need really high quality musical equipment. And she's got a piano, she has an electrical piano. Her band members have got guitars, trumpets, trombones, drums, and it has to be all very high quality. So the cost of musical equipment is actually quite significant for a musician, even though you and I might go down to the shops and get for relatively low costs. Um, that's not good enough if you're selling musical services. She also has to pay band musicians when she's going out. So on the training, on the training event we did where we asked her to come and, uh, and, uh, and play music, she brought three or four band members with her and she had to pay the band musicians. She has to pay copyright. That's a peculiar thing to music. If you use somebody else's music that you sing, you have to pay copyright. Phoebe writes her own music, so she doesn't have to pay copyright to herself. But if I play some of her music separately, I have to pay her copyright and there's a whole process for that happening and that's a cost. Then she has to pay for the venues. So if she's doing a concert, uh, the venue costs are quite significant. If she's traveling, which she generally does, uh, it, again, not Phoebe, but if a, a musician traveling to go to a, a wedding, for example, they have to travel to the venue and quite often they have to pay for the hotel and they have various admin costs themselves. You would expect a services business to have much lower 
fixed and admin costs than a, an organization that sells goods, which has to physically hold the goods somewhere. Um, so again, as an accountant, we want to focus on this to make sure that everything's in order. And if their admin costs are too high, we need to draw their attention to it so that they can improve the quality of their business. Things to watch out for, they have to create an image. And ironically, you have to spend quite a lot of money on creating an image. Of course, makeup, clothes, you can see Phoebe's wearing a, she's got a particular style. Um, uh, but the image is actually much greater than that. If you could, the, the lighting, that's creating an ambiance, that's part of an image. When she does YouTube videos, she's creating a buzz. She has got a bit, a bit of a buzz around um, uh, younger, the younger generation. She's got a song about the 20s. So she creates a bit of a buzz around 20 year olds. Um, all of this is about attracting a, an image to attract listeners. And there's a cost involved in that. Um, uh, she has to watch out for capacity at, at public venues. Um, when you go out to a venue, you pay a fixed amount of money for, uh, for a fixed amount of seating. If you buy too big a place and you don't fill it, you're going to spend all your money on the venue and you're not going to get enough uh, revenue to cover your costs. Conversely, if you get a venue that's too small, you can't get everybody in who wants to come along and you're just throwing away potential profit. So capacity at a venue is a big deal. Um, unpredictability is a real problem for, for streaming artists, artists that stream music, because they have to spend money on creating music and they have no idea how much streaming revenue they're going to get. Is this going to sell three albums or 30 million albums? And of course, depending on how much sells, and that's how much revenue you've got. So you have to spend the money up front, even though you have no idea how much revenue you've got. And again, as an accountant, we want to draw attention and highlight the key issues relating to unpredictability. And of course, amount of travel and hotel costs can be quite significant if the majority of your revenue comes from playing music at venues. If you forget to account for your travel costs when you're pricing your venue costs, or when you're pricing for a wedding, for example, um, you can very quickly lose all your profits because you just haven't costed the thing properly. And for some people, security is an issue. Um, so the musician's cash book, um, this lists out the transactions, Again, we've listed out one by one. You can see there's payment to a guitarist, payment to something called PRS or Performing Rights Societies about copyrights. Um, uh, and this was because um, uh, they did a, a wedding for the Smiths. So we've identified which event each of these costs related to. And you can see that the Smiths wedding was, uh, they charged 1200 pounds for it. Uh, and the categories that we've analyzed is between the weddings, events, band costs, travel, copyright. We've done our bank reconciliation. I haven't shown this because we've already seen this. This flows through to the trial balance. And I've pre-done this trial balance. Again, just make sure it uh, checks and goes back to zero. Good, I'm very happy with that. Uh, balance at the beginning of the period. Put the tra bank transactions through. There's a net positive income for the bank. That's a debit plus. Everything else flows by reference to that. If money comes in because of sales, it's a negative as a double entry. So I put in my double entry journal for the cash book. There were a couple of um, entries that were quite significant in these journals. We used up some instruments and some IT in order to, um, uh, in order to um, uh, carry out some of our services this, this month. We had to go to a venue and for whatever reason, the instruments and the IT actually got smashed up. So although we started off with, with being assets, we actually lost money on it. And that's a cost of the business. So we put that through as a journal. And there's another journal that we put through some, uh, some band costs through when actually, um, uh, sorry, we put through some cost to travel when actually it related to the band costs. So of that 1,850 pounds, 850 pounds should have been a band cost. So this journal corrects it by reducing the band cost and increasing the cost, reducing the travel costs, increasing the band costs, put these through to the trial balance. Happily, our checksum comes to zero. And when we this flows through to the accounts themselves, I'm delighted that this is a profitable business. Very happy with that. Even during this period, it's profitable. And the reason is we managed to get some wedding revenue. Maybe we did some really creative stuff with um, uh, using um, Zoom or some live streaming, 
um, but really creative stuff. We did some wedding, got some wedding revenues. We got some business income. Um, we got something called session income. Session income is where we go to play for other bands where someone else is paying us as a band member. That's called session income. And we've got 15,000 pounds this, this uh, month compared with 13,000 last year, which is remarkable in lockdown. Our cost of sales are similar relative to our turnover. So our gross profits have gone up. Remember the cost of sales are what are the direct costs we had getting that revenue. And in this case, it's we had to pay our band costs. We had to pay copyright music. We had to pay some software. And that brought us through in total to £6,000 of costs. Our gross profits are £9,000 in total. And yet our total administrative or fixed costs were £4,000. So I'm very happy. And our fixed costs were producing video. Uh, we did some video production work, which is all about creating image. There was no revenue related to it. We wanted people to think well of us and we had to spend money on it. We spent some money on social media and on PR. Um, uh, sort of advertising and PR, a couple of other costs. And these are our marketing costs of £2,000. We spend that irrespective of whether we had any revenue coming. Similarly, our administrative costs, I've just listed down the telephone or internet, state uh, phone costs, council tax, and, and various other costs, whatever they may be. Um, and it's, in this particular business, I'm delighted to say that we made a net income of £4,400 for the month. Although note, it's down from last year. And if we do some exploring, I'm sure there's some COVID stuff going on in there, which is a bit subtle. For example, this gross profit percentage of turnover may well be lower than the previous year's gross percentage because maybe we had to drop our prices. Um, anyway, we won't go into too much detail, but um, what the account allows us to do is to identify what's going on. So again, the illustration of this is we started off identifying what the key attributes of the musician were. We created a cash book, allocated the cost relative to that, put through some journals, did our bank reconciliation, I haven't shown that in this spreadsheet, put those through to the trial balance, and that's gone through to the accounts, and we can present these accounts to the to our clients, to the musician, or we, if we are the musician ourselves, we can identify exactly what's going on. And then the third, and again, we'll run through this even quicker, the third entity I wanted to go through is a food bank. I wanted to identify the um, the issues relating to charities. So the food bank is where food is either donated or purchased and given out to people that need it. And unfortunately in COVID, the demand for food is absolutely astronomic. So the key attributes for a charity are, how much are our total donations? Can we get people to sponsor us? So we have one person at the food bank who did a marathon in her back garden. And she raised a huge amount of money from sponsorships. So how much are donations, how much are sponsorships? Also, can we get corporates to sponsor us? Those go into sponsorships. And is that enough to cover the cost of buying food and personal hygiene, our premises costs, the IT and the admin? IT becomes quite a big deal because if you have to keep track of so many people referring others to receive food, you have to keep track of it also. We have to spend money on IT and admin. And the thing to watch out for is we never know on a week by week basis how much food we're going to need to give out. Uh, we have to, um, the, the donations of money coming in varies hugely from month to month. Our premises costs are fixed, whether or not we have donations. We also have wastage, wastage we need to worry about. Uh, how much do, those, do that wastage cost? And quite a lot of, lot of our effort is involved in stopping wastage altogether. So as it happens, we've got quite good procedures. Luckily at the Maidenhead Food Bank, we don't have wastage. But as a, as, a, as a food bank, as an accountant, we want to draw attention to what's going on in wastage if the clients don't know about it, because that's a critical aspect. Um, people who are donors hate giving money if they think it's just being thrown away. So even though it might not be a lot of money, it's a very critical thing for a food bank. So, okay, I'm gonna keep track of food waste separately. Um, and the final thing we just need to keep track of is, um, uh, is uh, volunteer support. So in the, we've um, transferred all these figures, uh, we created a cash book. And in the cash book, we've recorded the individual transactions 
we've allocated them using the categories that are specifically relate to the key things we identified. So we've identified donors separately from sponsors. We have to keep track of how much money we pay on food, rent, IT, and various others. And I've got this extract, and we've listed the total amount of money you spent in the month. Again, at the end of the month, we do a bank reconciliation. We check the figures look reasonable. We correct any errors. We then transfer these figures, figures through to our trial balance. And our trial balance, we list our cash book, we list the various journals. In this case, um, there's a credit, there's a supplier, and we owe money to them, so that's a negative. And if that's a negative, it becomes a positive on the other side of it. But there's a supplier that had invoiced us that we hadn't yet paid, but we need to account for it. So we're showing that there's a creditor at the end of the month, and there's cost during the month of 1,200 pounds. And so the 1,000 £1, pounds that we spent has gone up to 20,000 pounds by the time we finished uh, put that transaction through and there was another transaction with a, a sponsor someone agreed to promise to pay a thousand pounds which they hadn't yet paid the money to us it came through a week later after the end of the month so we're going to account for that by showing the sponsor as a debtor so that's a debit and the other side has to be a credit which is a donation or a minus that then comes through to our balance sheet and the balance sheet goes through to the accounts and with our accounts with our accounts format what we're identifying is the variable costs relative to the donations and those variable costs relative to the premises costs. And you can see, and this will be typical for most food banks at the moment, that the net costs don't cover the net revenues because the amount of money they're having to pay on food is so huge. You can see this year compared with last year, we've doubled on the food outgoing. Let me just stress, this is not Maidenhead Food Bank. This is an illustrative food bank. Um, this really doesn't represent what's going on in Maidenhead at all, but it is illustrative. Um, and again, I want to stress that this could be any charity we're talking about. And with a food bank, it's food. But if you had any other charity, depending on what the food bank is, what the charity is directly involved with, um, that's what they would be, um, that's what these figures would relate to for that charity individually. Um, so if you've got somebody with mental health problems and they have to employ um, a psychologist, instead of this being food and drinks, this might be psychologist costs, for example. But in this particular case, the food bank paid a huge amount more of money on food. Um, it got quite a lot of extra donations, but not enough. Luckily got some extra grants, but still it didn't get enough revenue to cover the fixed costs. And sadly, even though there's the lockdown, the fixed costs didn't reduce. Again, this is not Maidenhead because we had some amazing support from our landlords. So uh, this is not, but, but for, for, for a food bank that didn't get support, the costs would have been fixed from year to year. As you can see, they don't really change from previous year to this year, but it's really useful, even though we have an outgoing it's useful for, us to, useful for us to know. And in the previous year, it's actually not a good thing that we've got a net income. It's not good because with a charity, the ideal scenario is any revenue come in goes out for your charitable activity. So um, I can see straight away there's an error here because if I deduct my fit contribution to fixed costs for my revenue, that doesn't equal 5,196. So this is an illustration of how you can use accounts to identify um, obviousness errors. In this case, it's just a, an error in the addition in, in the accounts themselves, rather than the numbers that make it up. It might not have been. Okay, so what we've done this week is really just to illustrate only what we've talked about in the past, but I just wanted to show for people who are feeling a little bit daunted or a little bit anxious about the quantity of stuff going on. If you remember that accounting process where there's five or six steps, each of the steps we've been through, and I think based on the feedback I've had from people who've looked at the experience, the exercises, I think it's quite straightforward, each of the individual processes. I've been very excited with how well everyone's been doing. And if each of the individual processes is fairly straightforward, You've now got a template for how you put those through to formal accounts. And I'm delighted that halfway through this accounting course, I think already you can start to prepare some really meaningful and useful accounts 
and you can already start to interpret what they mean so that the business or charity that you're supporting or you're working for can start to get meaningful information. So as always, there's a, a simple exercise on the website. Uh, if you look at it, it'll just help bed down a lot of what we've done. Um, we didn't cover anything new this month, uh, this week rather. Um, and next week, we're gonna start getting onto the balance sheet and start getting onto computerized accounting. But for now, let me just thank you for having come along so far. Um, I hope you can, can congratulate yourself on having really made such huge progress. Either, as I said, if you start from scratch, you've really come very far. This is quite advanced being able to prepare uh, some meaningful and useful and reliable accounting information. And as I said, if you've already done this before, again, congratulations on securing or cementing your understanding of how accounts are created. And I hope you'll find that it's helped you when you do accounts in future to understand better where errors might arise and where you might want to focus attention to make sure the accounts are what they ought to be. So thank you for joining me. Many congratulations, and I hope to see you all next week. Thank you. Bye.